Something went in my eye. <laughs> Testing. Getting my hands on the footy and yeah, just being with my mates. I like, like, having fun. Just being around your friends and enjoying yourself. I like being outdoors. It just makes me happy. Having fun, I think, is the main thing. Because it doesn't really matter if you win, at least you get to play. And if you lose, it's not the end of the world. I don't like it when people get yelled at or when I get yelled at. It's pretty embarrassing when someone's shouting at you halfway through the game. Watch your passes. You're so bad. You're not that great. It's mainly how they say it. Well, it makes me feel like I'm useless and I can't do anything. I saw a father bashing his own son. And all the parents were arguing with each other. It was really stressful and it made me just not feel good at all. I, I stopped because I was being yelled at and it just wasn't any fun anymore. He, he's not put on this earth to, to be bashed, to be stripped of his confidence. Yeah, they don't understand that I'm doing my best, so... Just stop, stop. Would you please, like, stop yelling at me on the court because it's making me feel like I can't do it anymore. If they've got to yell out, they could say, like, something encouraging. Things like, good job. Or good pass. You're good, just keep trying and you'll get there. Oh, that was a great job. You're doing great. Try as hard as you can. When I hear people yelling from the sidelines, I want them to say, good job. We're just kids. Just let us have fun, let us do what we love. We're just here to have fun. Just let kids be kids. And thank you again to the Australian Sports Commission for that wonderful series of videos. Uh, haven't they been terrific to give a, the, uh, uh, together with the videos that we got from uh, Brighton uh, Grammar and Doveton College, uh, bring a voice of children into the conference, and uh, this, this is important. Um, we heard at the dinner that we had someone who had come from as far away as Toronto to, to be here. Is, is, are you still here? Oh, maybe gone back to Norway. Oh yes, oh well done. But also, also uh, I, uh, I, was, I was talking with some of the other people at the dinner and uh, there's people who've come from uh, remote areas and, and travelled by uh, ute and uh, uh, for hours over, over dirt roads to get here, which is terrific. Um, and uh, there's people who've given up uh, work time, uh, given up uh, uh, three days' pay in order to be here. It, it's an indication of just such commitment from all of you wonderful people. So, so thank you. I think you should give all of yourselves a round of applause. <laughs> this final session is really a, a, a pretty relaxed and informal one. We've got a couple of handheld mics amongst uh, uh, some of our wonderful guest speakers, um, and we've got uh, um, mics that will come round to you as well, and uh, we'll uh, give you a chance to uh, uh, ask questions or reflect upon. What was your favourite moment at this conference? Uh, what, what are some of the key things uh, that you uh, got out of it and, and are going to take away with you. And we're going to have uh, Lisa O'Brien, uh, the uh, uh, CEO of the Smith family, uh, to wrap up the conference at the end briefly. Now, bad news. Andrew Jackamos, who was going to be talking, is unfortunately not at all well. He's had to apologise. And, 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 and he uh, really, it, 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 and it's not an excuse, his, his PA's uh, uh, saying he really is really very ill. So uh, we, we wish him all the best. We wish him a speedy recovery. Um, now we, we had to take an executive decision. Do we substitute another speaker in at short notice or do we give you an extra 20 minutes at the end of the day? And we, 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 went, we went with the, the finish early. <laughs> Yeah, and, and, and Lisa, Lisa, Lisa's promised not to talk for an extra 20 minutes to make up for it. <laughs> so, 
really, this is, this is uh, a, an opportunity for us to uh, talk just amongst ourselves, but I, th I thought I'd uh, start off with uh, a couple of questions to each of our, our participants, just, just to get the ball rolling. And for me, one of the really telling moments of the conference was when Karen asked people in the audience, who here is a teacher or has had teacher training? And about 200 hands went up. And then she asked, and which of you had a proper course, not just a workshop, but a proper course in parent engagement as part of your training? And every single hand went down. I, is that the same answer you get uh, back in the United States as well? And, and, and what can we do to, to turn that around? So is this on? Yes, okay. It is the same answer that I get in the States, and not just in the States. I've traveled to Mexico, Singapore. Um, we were in Lisbon, Debbie and I were in Lisbon together a few years back. And when I talk to practitioners, and not just teachers, I'm talking about people who work in after school programs, and anyone who has had um, an opportunity or is working with families, when I ask them, uh, except for social workers, when I ask them, uh, if they had any real significant coursework on how to partner with families, how to engage families in both their funds of knowledge and parent knowledge, the answer is no. So what I'm trying to do back in the States, this has become my personal journey and um, sort of the movement that I'm trying to build is to work on the teacher certification, the principal certification, and the superintendent district legal certification uh, such that family engagement and proficiency in family engagement is a part of what is judged when someone is uh, being assessed to be a, a proficient uh, practitioner. I did learn, we did accomplish that in Massachusetts for our current teachers, our practicing teachers, but now we have to work on the certification process for our pre-service teachers. So we have seen some movement and policy in the states, but we have a long way to go because once we put it in the certification, uh, then the higher education and the teacher training institutions, principal training institutions, leadership institutions will have to then change their practice. Mm. So that's what we're going after, the certification qualifications. Mm. And wouldn't it be great if we could achieve the same here in Australia? And I hope somebody's gonna ask a question about that. Uh, think about your question, but I'll give you a little chance to think, because I wanted to ask Lisa, because Smith Family is a co-sponsor of this, uh, plays a really prominent role, and I know Smith Family does, it, does uh, several things, but one of the ones that's most relevant is Learning for Life, which is just a, a wonderful program, and I, I, we haven't heard that much about it so far. Could you tell us something about it? Love to, love to, Stephen. Um, so, and in fact, education is the, the real focus of the Smith family today. Many of you will know the organisation. We've been around since 1922. And over that time, we have focused our work on supporting disadvantaged children and their families. But in the early years, our focus was very much on that welfare approach of a handout to families. And then we recognised from about 30 years ago that we were seeing the same families come through the door, multiple generations of the same family, and there were clearly large pockets of intergenerational disadvantage. And we're thinking, well, if we're really going to make a difference, what's the early intervention approach that we should be taking? And so at that point, we looked to the research, and the answer was very, very clear that education should be how we were working with families, because that's the key to breaking that cycle. But we also, of course, talk to our families, and they were also very clear, help our children to get an education. So 30 years ago, in response to that, we completely changed the orientation of the organisation, and we only now focus on supporting disadvantaged kids with their education. We are now the largest education-focused children's charity in Australia. Last year, our work reached 127,000 children and young people right across the nation. Um, th that's a significant footprint and we're doing great work, but the size of the problem is enormous in Australia and I'm sure all of you in the room are aware that there's 1.1 million children growing up in poverty today in Australia. And so there is enormous need for the sort of support that we're providing. So our Learning for Life program is our core education program. Uh, it's, we provide it currently to 33,000 children and young people across the country. 
Uh, it has three key elements to it. The first is some financial support that has to be spent on education-related expenses, and the receipt of that support is actually linked to the child's school attendance. The second component is where one of our program coordinators are working closely with the family, so this is obviously a big component is of parental and family engagement, so working with the family to keep that child on track with their education and to assist them in any way they can to that end. And the third component are a whole range of um, learning support and mentoring programs that we provide on the short term. But the Learning for Life program is a long-term support. It starts in primary school and we go all the way through with that child till ideally they finish year 12 or they go on into further study. One of the things that's key for us in providing this long-term support, because it's not trivial, is are we actually making a difference? What's the effectiveness of this support over the long term? And so in recent years, we've focused a lot on data and how do we measure the effectiveness of the program? And we know today that 84% of children and young people that um, we have supported long term, one year after they exit the program, 84% of those kids are in work or full-time study. So it's a fantastic mm. result that we're achieving over the long term. So we know it works, but at the core of why it works is because there's a big element of parental engagement yeah. in how we're working with families. And <laughs> Yes. <laughs> well deserved, because uh, yeah, it, it, it's true, isn't it, Lisa, that uh, uh, parental engagement is, is, is really key, that it's, it's not just uh, uh, handouts to kids. This is about actual working with the family, with, with the parents, and, and, and properly engaging with them. In, 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 and everything I see is it's, it's a terrifically respectful uh, and, and, and genuine engagement as well. It is, but we also partner with schools. So we provide a bridge. You know, we, we work with families beyond the school gate, but we do it in close partnership with schools because that's essential for us to be effective as well. Yeah. And Debbie, incidentally, uh, uh, we, we should introduce our speakers. They're, 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 they're Lisa O'Brien, CEO of Smith Family. Uh, they're Debbie Pusher, uh, University of Saskatchewan in Canada. Absolutely extraordinarily wonderful person with huge insights. And uh, uh, Dr. Karen Mapp uh, from Harvard University. Absolutely wonderful person with huge insights. And, and, and now we're all friends, so, so we, we, we don't, need to, no, don't need any more introductions than that. Uh, Debbie, uh, one of my other moments was, was listening to uh, part of... Uh, in, in some of the videos you showed, uh, the, the, the Cree grandmother mm -hmm. um, and her comment at the end, why did they have to go into the school to tell them what was important? Um, and uh, I'm wondering, what's the follow-up? Was there any, after that story happened, any change in the system uh, that meant that schools were um, more responsive to uh, those, those particular needs? We've had um, a Truth and Reconciliation Commission in Canada over the past uh, few years. And it's something I think as a country that we're working really hard at, that um, reconciliation is being defined as a really deep respect for the people um, and the experiences that they've had. And so I think that all of our schools are working to understand what that means and then how do we live it in our, in our practice. So we have schools with high indigenous populations who I think have really done some good work to move out into the community, to attend the cultural ceremonies, to learn the world view. There's a very different world view and image of a child with our indigenous population, an image of a family, much more communal than, than our Eurocentric view and so I think people are really working hard at that. Um, do we have a long way to go, Stephen? Absolutely. Um, you know, I could, I could give you lighthouse examples of wonderful things that are happening. I could give you examples where we have uh, much more work to do and the school continues to be that protectorate um, where they expect um, parents and families to come to us. Um, so we're learning. We're learning to move into the community. We're learning to move into new cultural groups, but mm. lots to do, lots to do yet. I think some of those experiences in, in Canada will probably 
have resonance. And, and I'm really interested if there's some of our uh, colleagues from Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander communities here in the audience whether, whether you might want to comment as well. Uh, I, I'm reminded actually uh, with some uh, consultations we had with people from the Northern Territory and, and there was this lovely story about uh, uh, a newly appointed school principal who went to a remote community and he was actually getting pretty good results at the school and school retention was quite good but he wasn't seeing parents so he, so he went to the community and said, can we get better parent engagement? And one of the elders said to him, do you see that there's a folding chair outside your school uh, gate? He said, yes. He said, do you know that there's an elder sitting there all during the day? He said, yeah. He said, why do you think you've got good school retention? <laughs> there's an elder there telling the kids to stay in school. <laughs> and, and this principal went back with a slightly different idea of what engagement was all about and, and a bit better educated about the local community and the value they put on education. So uh, I, I think part of what's involved is having to understand what the local community uh, is doing and uh, uh, having, having respect for, for the efforts that they're putting in. So, so over to you. Uh, anyone want to comment on any of those, those aspects? And if you don't want to comment on any of what we've raised, what, what do you want to raise? Yes, down here. Yeah, that works. Um, Wonderful. So if you can say who you are, um, you don't have to. It's not compulsory. <laughs> if, if you want to remain anonymous, that's all right. But uh, if you say who you are and where you're from, that just helps us understand where the question's coming from. Um, I'm Emma. I'm from Barnardos, working in New South Wales. Um, and I guess looking at all of the amazing success stories of um, family engagement over the last few days, the common denominator for me doesn't seem to be just parent engagement, but a genuine to d a desire and motivation to actually want to work with families and engage with families. Um, and that seems to be across the board of all the success stories that we've heard. And given what Tim said this morning about humans having an innate ability to, I guess, pick up on when people aren't engaging genuinely, that can be quite damaging for families who really need that engagement the most. So. I guess my question is, um, do you think it's possible, and if so, how can we motivate schools and services to want to genuinely engage with families and ignite or reignite that passion to want to engage with families and see the value in engagement with families? For me, one of the things that I think is really important is that we have teachers engage in experiential learning. It isn't just about reading the theory or knowing the research. I think that's a really important piece. But what I've seen in the work that I've done with teachers, pre-service or in-service, it's when we actually move out into the community and have some experiences that their heart changes. And that, for me, is the critical piece. So <clears throat> an example, we have um, an organization in our city called the Friendship Inn and they serve breakfast and lunch 365 days a year. So I will often take groups of students, graduate and undergraduate, and will go not to volunteer, which is what most people do, but just to get in line, get a tray, get our lunch, and sit with people at the Friendship Inn. And to come alongside, to hear their stories, to talk with them, to share who we are, and it's in that connection of our humanness that I think we see possibility to break down assumptions and stereotypes. <clears throat> Some of you have probably heard me tell this story, but I had a group of undergraduates at the Friendship in one day. It was a very busy, it was just before what people refer to as check day. So income assistance was coming and people were at the end of their um, food and money and so on. And so it was a very full and very tense kind of day there. And um, some folks came around and they were serving children these big gourmet cookies. 
and they weren't giving them to the adults, just to the kids. And one of my students, Mike, was there talking with a family. And because it had been so busy, my students decided they wouldn't eat, they'd just mix. And this little girl takes her cookie, she breaks it in half. She gives half her cookie to Mike and she said, you didn't get a cookie. <laughs> and here's a little girl who doesn't know when she's going to eat again, doesn't typically get a treat, and she's willing to share it with Mike. And he came to me and he literally had tears running down his face. And he said, Deb, in my community, I don't think the kids would have been that generous. And so again, that sense of who are the, these people, what are their values, you know, all of those pieces, it just, it challenged assumptions about people who live in context of poverty, people who receive income assistance, people who go to a soup kitchen. We had to examine all of that and examine our own sense of who do we want to be alongside the families and children with whom we work. That's what creates the opening for me. So if, if I said that yesterday, if I were in charge of the world, and I, today I still am not in charge of the world, just so you know. Um, I think we need those kinds of experiences. We need to walk in core communities led by parents and family members who live there, who can introduce us to the community. We need to participate in First Nations sweat lodges. We need to do, we need to go to the mosque. We need to come alongside people so we can enter their worlds and truly come to know them. That's when we have an opening to start our work. I don't think we're going to achieve it in, in other places unless we build those possibilities in. That's where I've seen change happen. Karen? So. I absolutely agree. I think that the more we have people doing work together, changing implicit bias. So I do a lot of work with um, some Harvard faculty and others on this whole concept of implicit bias. And so implicit bias is where we have a perception of another person or another group that's based on you know, experiences and maybe information that's false, but it's become a part of who we are. So Beverly Tatum, and I don't know if any of you have read any of her work, she wrote a great book. It's called um, Why Do All the Black Kids Sit Together in the Cafeteria? And it, it's a US context, but I think it's a wonderful book about our identities. And she talks about the smog of racism or the smog of implicit bias. She says, we breathe it in and it's invisible and we don't often even know that it's there, but it affects how we think. The only way we break out of those implicit biases is what Debbie talks about, is when we have a different experience from the picture that's painted in our mind. And so, for example, with the Parent Teacher Home Visit Project out of Sacramento, which has been taken up by many school districts in the United States, one of the things that I always hear, whenever I go to their conference or I go to a meeting where teachers are talking about their experiences, I bring tissue. Because inevitably, someone tells a story about how they've been transformed and they're now really passionate about family engagement because they had an implicit bias that those parents, fill in the blank, wherever you are, what those parents means, they had this bias that those parents didn't care. They didn't come, they don't come to the parent-teacher conference. They don't follow the instructions that I give when I ask them to do things at home. They live in poverty. Those kids, our goal is to get their kids away from those communities and those families because we think that those families are impoverished and what possibly could they offer? So they have all these biases in their head. And then they go to the homes. And you start with the willing, you start with people who want to do it first, right? They get trained, they go into the home and all of their biases about those families get shattered. And inevitably they tell the story about their own transformation, about how they now see their families very differently. They now honor and respect those families' parent knowledge and their funds of knowledge and they feel uplifted. They feel excited. I've had teachers tell me that their relationships with their families 
is what drives them to go to work every day. That they feel so much more energized now. And I'm not, not just teachers, but other people in the schools, after school folks, librarians tell me, my relationship and partnership with families is the wind beneath my wings now, right? So that's why I bring tissues, because either I'm crying <laughs> when they tell these stories, or if I bring my students and my students listen to these stories, they're crying and the teachers are crying. Just one quick uh, additional story. So I had some secondary school teachers and the principal and uh, one young man who was a student come to my class to talk to my students about family engagement and about the parent-teacher home visit project. And the young man had been struggling in school and he told a story about how when his teacher came to his house, how that made him feel that she really cared and loved him. And she started crying, right? And she, could, she had never heard him say this, but he said, I know she loves me. I know she wants to do the best for me. And now my mom and dad know that too. And so they make sure, like that elder, they make sure that I go to school. And she just, she just, you know, she, <laughs> She had never heard him say that. His name was Manny. I'll never forget it. And my students, he said, you know, I'll always remember her because she's what turned on the light for me in terms of why education is important, right? So this work can be very frustrating. And I've had some of you come up to me and say, you know, I have XYZ person in my school or in my program who doesn't get it. What do I do? And I say, you know, bring them along when you're having conversations with families so that they can hear families talk about how they're passionate. Or bring one of their colleagues that you think kind of gets it and then have that colleague bring them. So this is a movement. Family engagement is a movement. And it's gonna take a while for us to get everybody on board. But from what I see here, I mean, to me, I'm, I'm so stunned. There's so many of you in this room and you know, at the last day of a conference, a lot of time it's like a ghost town. <laughs> so this tells me, you know, how much energy you all have uh, created as a part of this conference. Um, I think the other way in which we can sort of address this challenge is around growing the understanding of the problem. And so at a grassroots level, you know, there's a movement that can happen. But I think there also needs to be a broader understanding, certainly in Australia, around, you know, what, what is the underpinning issue here? And we do, unfortunately, have a tendency sometimes to, to blame the parents around their lack of engagement or their child's performance and to blame them for their socioeconomic circumstances. And I think there, certainly the Smith family, we want to advocate more strongly around this issue so that there is a greater understanding that for these families who are facing a whole myriad of challenges and often they're in financial disadvantage because there's a disability or a health issue or because they're underemployed or unemployed, um, a whole range of circumstances that have very little to do with the parents and certainly very, very little to do with the children. And so a greater understanding which will help to break down those barriers and stop that blaming. Um, I think this is at a societal level. I think every, I'm pre preaching to the converted in this room, but I think there's not a broad understanding of the circumstances of the young people and families that we're trying to reach. Oh, we, I will recognise the three people in the uh, front and then I'll recognise the three people in the back. So, just here. Hi, um, Mariko Francis from Monash University in the Education Department. Um, I've got a question or more of a, 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 a posing a challenge for everyone, I guess. Um, in Victoria, we have VIT standards and Australian standards to meet teacher training on an annual basis. And I'm not too familiar with um, the programs that address the standards for teachers to annually train and upskill. But I know that one of the two standards, um, standard 7.3 and 7.4 is to engage um, parent carers and to engage with professional teaching networks in broader communities. I don't really know or am aware of how many programs that are available to upskill teachers. And I think as a collective, we need to work together, 
not only with other educators but with industry and communities to provide those programs for teachers and then they can access. Now we're going to, we're going to take three, three questions three slash comments in a row and then we'll, yes, so, so you and then over there. Um, hi, mine's for Debbie, so mine, I'm just going to stand up because you won't be able to see me otherwise. Uh, my name's Michelle, so I'm from uh, Queensland University of Technology. I'm a PhD student. Um, I had a question for you about your, about the grandmother who was in your film talking about her grandson and the feather mm -hmm. in his hat. And I, that was very powerful for me. And I wrote down what she said. She said, we shouldn't have to explain ourselves all the time. And I, I found myself reflecting on that quite a lot. And I don't, I'm not sure if you know, um, if, if you know this or not, but I'm wondering whether or not she meant we shouldn't have to explain ourselves as in we shouldn't have to come up and, and explain these parts of culture. Um, schools should be asking us about it. Or if it was more, this is our culture, we shouldn't have to share this. this should it be enough to just say this is part of culture and this is really important? And I, I, do you know what I mean? Yeah, and I'm, I'm wondering yeah, if you Yeah, I do. Have I do know what you mean, Michelle. And there, uh, both of those things might be at play, mm. right? I think you're, you're probably really insightful in, in thinking about that. You know, having worked with Maria for a long time, she's very willing to come to the school and explain, you know, why, why things are the way they are for, for her grandchildren, how we could think about the incorporation of um, cultural practices in, in more important ways. I think though as, as, you know, as our First Nations people as well, um, there's, there's something sacred about what they know and there's been a lot of cultural appropriation uh, over centuries as well. And so I think, um, I think there's a time and a place to respect that there's a tradition at play that that feather is the connection to the spirit world and, and the ancestors and the uncle who had passed and that her saying that to us doesn't need to be justified or explained. That, that it's up to us to say thank you for that and, and let it go. So you, I think both of those things are at play and, and there's a sensitivity in knowing sometimes how to, how to move between, between those pieces. <coughs> I, in some of my writing, I write about being a guest host in our schools. I mentioned that yesterday. And I think, again, we're never one or the other. We're always both. And so it's, it's that balance, that learning to move in that kind of a way um, with, with those, those people who trust their children to us. And just over here, too. Uh, my name's Lisa Cheerio. I'm from um, Cairns. I'm actually attending as an interested parent. I'm a registered nurse by trade and I used to teach at James Cook University to undergraduate nursing and psychology students. And I just wanted to make the comment that in our profession of nursing, we very much engage with families. And I think there is probably a lot to learn from um, that area. Um, we create reams of paper <laughs> on family and community engagement. We do do have uh, in, um, home visits um, to assess a person's home and, and we talk about family situations and supports and so on. We also connect through primary health care to services. So I really think that's probably an area that we could tap into as a resource. And the other thing I wanted to say was that while it, um, this area of engagement has felt very natural to me with my background, it has been surprising that it, um, it's taken so long in education, but in our school in particular, our barrier is knowledge deficit. And even being aware of the term parent engagement was unknown to many of our staff until in first term our principal put out an invitation for a staff member to attend this conference. They didn't know, they hadn't heard of the term. So we're 
years behind. <laughs> We've got a long way to go. But it's wonderful that you're all creating the shortcuts for us <laughs> and, um, and we get to learn from you. Thanks for that comment. We'll take the three up the back and then we'll pass back to all of our panellists to answer. Hi, um, is that on? Oh, Actually, I suspect it's turned into more than three, so, so I'll, I will leave uh, Rebecca to just pick the three that she is uh, happiest to give the microphone to. What power? Okay. Oh, goodness. Um, first of all, I, I actually would like to say thank you for the organisation of this event. Uh, it's been wonderful. I'm an early childhood uh, director from New South Wales, and it's been an interesting experience to come here and not see as many of my cohort or my profession actually represented here as I thought that there would be. Um, given that one of the quality areas for our national improvement system is actually connecting with community and engaging families, it's not worded that way, but I thought that we would have had a little bit more uh, presence in, in this. But what I wanted to say, ask or make a comment about is what seems to be the disconnect between the earliest years and the school years. And, and I think it's fantastic to hear so much discussion around the school years and the connection, say, between the Smith family and the schools. What about the connection between the very earliest years, quite often the years when families come into their first contact with community or with another service beyond the family? I wonder how that plays out in places like Canada and America. I know of some of the American programs, um, but you know, even just what Tim was talking about this morning around neurobiology, that's something I've been studying quite a lot about and the importance of parent engagement in those first two years in particular. I'd love to hear your thoughts. We'll take the other two questions, but remember that one. And if you forget it, I'll remind you. <laughs> Hello, I also would just like to echo my colleague here saying thank you so much um, for this fantastic event. Um, I'm, my name's Rachel, I'm a social worker and I'm also a PhD student studying parent and community engagement in a particular area of socio-spatial disadvantage. Um, I've been very interested in some of the language and the discourses that we've been throwing around over the last couple of days. You know, we've been using words such as vulnerable, disadvantaged, um, at risk. Um, even the word engagement is not necessarily a word that parents I have worked with in my profession would use. Um, so, and, and reflecting on Tim's talk this morning about um, doing no harm, you know, and, and that's very strongly the basis of social work training, I, I feel, and probably a lot of other helping professions do no harm. And I've just been really reflecting on the language we use and also the lens that we are um, seeing the world through as professionals. I'd love some comment from any or all of you around can we change our discourse or our lens around doing no harm, particularly with the words that we're using and the way we conceptualise the families that we wish to engage? Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Kay. I'm from the um, Western Australia, a remote, remote uh, town called Carnarvon in the Gascoigne region. Um, First of all, I'd just like to thank um, the Good Start Foundation because I was awarded a scholarship to attend this event. And um, yeah, I'm, I'm enjoying it immensely. And uh, if it wasn't for the scholarship, we probably wouldn't have been able to make it over here. So thanks again for that. Um, <laughs> thank you. Um, yeah, just to let you know, like, um, our, our school, Carnarvon Community College, was uh, identified by the minister in 2014 as um, having a very low school attendance. Um, it was around 49, 49 to 50% school attendance for our kids. So then um, the pilot remote school attendance strategy what, uh, came about. Um, so yeah, I work for the remote school attendance strategy and 
we, we work directly with the parents to try and um, empower our parents and make them stronger. Um, in other words, like we, we say we're trying to teach our parents how to be parents. Because um, a lot of them, uh, they got multiple issues in their lives. Um, and our kids at the school, they deal with um, um, drugs, alcohol, uh, domestic violence on a daily basis. Um, and that's why a lot of them don't go to school. The parents don't engage with the school. The, the teachers don't engage with the parents. Um, a lot of the teachers just get sent up to Carnarvon straight from university, young, young teachers. A lot of them haven't, have never met an Aboriginal person before in their lives. And um, that they really don't know how to handle these kids and, and their parents. And they don't engage with the parents. Um, we're always trying to push to the school. You need to, you, we, you need to give your um, staff cult some cultural awareness training. But, um, you know, it's always, oh, we got no money. And, you know, we say you need to employ some Aboriginal people, um, Aboriginal Islander education workers. Still the same answer, we got no money. Um, our school is 80% Aboriginal kids. And, yeah, they're missing out on a lot of school. Um, we, we're, we're working very, very hard to try and engage with the parents and... Um, that's very frustrating. It can be very frustrating. Sometimes our workers, we get frustrated. We blame the parents. And, but then we sit back and we'll think, oh, nah. Um, you know, then we start feeling sorry for the parents and, oh, we've got to help them. And, yeah, so, um, um, yeah, it's, it's very hard and frustrating working with our parents. But we don't give up. We try and try. Um, yeah, so... And thank, thanks everybody again and uh, enjoyed the conference. And I'll have a lot to take back home. And, and thank you for, for your work there in Carnarvon. Uh, and if people uh, want some thoughts about this, go to the Eraci website. Uh, we commissioned some research uh, that was focused on uh, parent engagement with Aboriginal families. Uh, it was research done in New South Wales, but uh, I think there's some really good lessons that's applicable anywhere. Uh, one, of, one, of, one of the important lessons, of, uh, and it's a really good answer to the people who say we've got no money, is you don't actually need, uh, uh, the, the research suggests, uh, uh, to train teachers in language or give them a really intensive cultural awareness course. Just Encourage them to have a bit of respect and to talk. And that makes a huge difference. And I've, I've never come across an Aboriginal person, uh, 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 particularly someone who's, who's really proud of their culture, uh, if you sit down with them and ask them uh, uh, about culture, uh, you, you won't get away in under two hours. I mean, my goodness, uh, it, it's so easy to find out. Uh, uh, so um, uh, just just uh, being able to engage like that doesn't cost money, uh, and and that's something that unfortunately, sadly, we're not teaching those young young kids out of university. Uh, they, they they don't don't even get taught those basics as to how to how to start a conversation. But there were lots of stuff in that. Can can we get comments from all of our panelists? Wow, those were a lot of really good questions. So I'll try to touch on some of them because I think there's some connections here. So whenever I hear it costs too much money, I know that means I'm scared to do it. <laughs> That's what that means in most cases. I'm scared, I, I can't. Um, and so you have to understand that uh, the person who says that and the organization they may represent um, is fearful of failure. And they feel that, well, if we're going to spend the money, we, do, we don't want to fail. So, and, and Stephen is right. In a lot of cases, we're not really talking about money. But we're also talking about time. And they're also saying, we don't have the time to fail. Or we don't have the time because we're scared. And so that's why taking people through the experiences and having them see that... Um, by talking and communicating and honoring families, that 
It really is, you don't, you can't afford not to do it, is really what it comes to. Because in the end, do you rather spend a few dollars on building the relationship now, or a lot of money on having to take care of these kids later? So if you want to talk about, I mean, we, we don't have time to talk about return on investment studies that have already been done that show, you know, for every dollar you spend early on with building relationships between families and schools um, is, is so much less money than you spend later in having to deal with kids that are in trouble. So those are some studies that you could look at if you want to show the hard dollars about why it's worth it to put the money in now. Um, another thing I could go on and on about, but I won't, is the young lady who talked about the language um, there are some wonderful articles about asset-based versus deficit-based language when we're talking about our, our families. And um, if you find me afterwards, I can, I can give you some of those citations. There's some wonderful articles. There's one that I'm not thinking of right now, the name of it, but it's basically about we as researchers and the research community are we doing research that's actually harming the communities? Are we doing research that's disrespectful of the communities? Um, so I definitely hear you. And um, one of the things I think I'm going to try to do in the dual capacity framework 2.0 uh, is to think about adding in something in the process conditions about uh, culturally uh, respectful uh, practice. Uh, it right in the process conditions because I've been hearing more and more about people saying, you know, we want to make sure that we drive home the fact that we want our practice to be culturally responsive and respectful. So I don't know if that's I'm trying I'm trying to connect some of the, the questions that people uh, ask and the statements that they made. Um, the pre-K, the zero to five space. Um, I want you all to go on Google and look up something called the Boston Basics. This is a, an initiative I'm on the board, um, I'm on the advisory board for, and it's uh, Ron Ferguson, who is a researcher at Harvard, and he's in the Kennedy School, but his passion is really family engagement. Um, it started with our help, this wonderful new program called the Boston Basics, and it's directly targeting the zero to five community. Uh, you know we have Head Start, at least I hope we will still have Head Start. Um, before, uh, never mind. Okay, we won't go there. But but you know we have Head Start. Where we've learned a lot from Head Start. If Heather was here, she could talk a lot about the Head Start family engagement framework that she helped create. So I think there's a lot of new and very exciting things happening in the zero to five space. And maybe when you have your conference in two years from now, um, <laughs> you could get some folks to come to talk about the great practice that's happening in the zero to five space. Folks, if you want us to have another conference, you can, you're allowed to write that in, in, in the writing space in your evaluation <laughs> form. Uh, I'll get Debbie to make some brief comments and then we will call on Lisa to do the closing summation of the conference. Thanks so much. Again, three really great focal areas. Going to the early childhood, the early years piece first. I mean, what's happened in the province of Saskatchewan where I'm from in Canada is that we had two different ministries responsible for our children. So we had education for those that were part of the formal school system, and then our uh, childcare sector was, was in the social services ministry. And so a few years ago, the government merged those. So now we have an early learning branch that's looking at learning and care. So that's really helped us a lot because people would say, oh, that's not our jurisdiction, oh, well, we don't fund that, et cetera. And there were documents for one sector and different documents for another. And so what the government's done, for example, is we've got now a play and exploration guide that's used in childcare and pre-K kindergarten. And so that, that movement through the early years is becoming a little bit more fluid. And because we're using similar uh, documents, childcare, providers and pre-kindergarten and kindergarten early year teachers are starting to work together. That's just one example. The Family Engagement Handbook is another one. It was initially just designed for our pre-K K teachers. It's now birth onwards. So I see glimmers of hope in that area, but you're so right. We've, we've operated as different sectors, and that's something I think we're understanding 
differently now as well. <clears throat> In terms of the language question, absolutely. I think we have to work really hard to be strength-based, respectful, honoring. We all are working on that, I think. The word engagement for me is a very conscious word. Um, I've really used it because it means to make a moral commitment to one another. And so I think sometimes when we use the words, part of what we need to do is say why we're using it, what we intend with it, to create a common vocabulary. Mm -hmm. So I think it's okay if it isn't parents' vocabulary. Initially, if we co-create and co-construct a vocabulary that represents our deep beliefs about families and about our work together. Uh, in terms of, of that last question, um, you know, we don't have time, we don't have the money. <clears throat> I think we have to ask really hard questions about how we spend our time in this work. And I think, again, I, I often speak about or write about those taken for granted practices that we have in our schools, those things we do year after year after year because we've always done them. And perhaps how we find time to do the really important work is by giving up on some of the things that we've been doing that maybe are no longer effective, right? So I've said to people, you know, I used to travel and I brought a map, an alarm clock, a camera. Um, what else did I bring? Um, something to play music on and so on, right? Now I just bring my iPhone. Right? And I wouldn't go back to those other days. Like We've moved away from, and schools haven't always done that. Mm -hmm. So um, a, a graduate student that I worked with began his career up in Fort Liard in the Northwest Territories in, the United, or in, in Canada. And um, he had never been a teacher before. He was a large white man of Scottish heritage in a Dene community and began his career by being taken to every home of every child he was going to teach and sitting at that kitchen table and having tea. And those became the people he fished with, he hunted with, and so on. So when we look at teacher contact hours, why is that home visit program, that initial cultural contact, not considered part of our, our contact hours? Right? When we build it in, we say it's important, we give teachers time to do it, we're not so time poor anymore. Right? No reason not to. No excuses anymore. And Bill went with a cultural liaison person, a member of the community, who helped him with that fear piece. Right? So again, I think it's part of defining what is it that we value, what is important to us, and making sure that's the critical work we're doing and not supervising lunch or something that someone else can do. So I think we have a lot of rethinking to do in what we value and how we fill out those teacher contact times. Stephen, can I just jump in for one second? I'll just make it really quick, really quick, because um, Debbie reminded me of something. So the other day um, when I did this session, who was in my, my session that's still, still here? Okay, so one of the fun exercises we did was I had folks write down um, five family engagement events that they already do right now, right? And then I asked them some questions about whether or not that event was linked to learning. And we all had a good laugh because when we looked at all five of the events, we found out in most cases either none or only one of them was linked to learning. The point I'm trying to make here is that we already spent a lot of time, and this is what Debbie's saying, if you look at what we do over the course of the year with families, we already spent a lot of time doing events that are just random acts and don't make a lot of sense half the time. So what if we took those events and repurposed them? Yes. So, so what I often say to school principals is that I'm not actually asking you to spend more time. I'm ask, asking you to look at what you're doing now and spending it more wisely. So if we took what we were already doing and made it more culturally conscious, more culturally competent. If we used it in ways that the research says makes sense, then we'd be more effective. So I think, again, it's about, uh, and I thank you, Debbie, because you, you made me think about this and make sure I said it. It's about repurposing what we're already doing. So that's one of those ways you can sneak it in when somebody tells you, well, you know, we don't have any more time. I say, you know what, I'm gonna make a deal with you. We're not talking about more time. We're talking about doing what you do now more effectively. Lovely note to finish. Can we thank both Debbie and Kate? And it's 
Our turn to get off the stage and leave the closing address to Lisa. So, thank you very much. And um, as we close, in continuing respect, I want to again acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which we're meeting here today, the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation. I'm very conscious that I stand here to make some closing remarks and I'm standing between you and your homes, your families and your communities and that many of you have quite a distance to travel. Uh, so I promise not to take more than an hour in just getting through the remarks. No, as we've already said, we're going to finish a little bit early. But what an amazing journey we've been on together. I can't imagine that there is anyone here who hasn't learned something that they can take back with them to their place of work or to their role as a parent, something that you've learned in the last few days. Um, so my call to you today is to make sure that you don't, as Jenny Brassington said, make it an expensive two-day vacation, rather that you reflect on what you've learned here today and within the rubric of growth, that growth mindset that we heard about on the first day, look at how you can apply these lessons to your day-to-day -day practice and to your interactions with family, schools and their communities. As a parent myself of two mostly adult children, there are some days when they are less adult, <laughs> but they are in their 20s, um, but there, I had a few I wish moments during the conference, certainly. I'm incredibly proud of my children, but I couldn't help thinking about how they might have been, how they might have turned out if I had been a little more attentive and a little more actively involved in what was happening in their schools and their learning journey. But I suspect others of you may well have had the same thoughts. So now I can hear the Mission Impossible music playing in the background because I have the challenging task, obviously, um, of summing up what we've heard over the last couple of days. But to, to be honest, I don't think that's possible. So I'm just going to summarise some of the richness that we've heard throughout the conference and speak about some of the key themes. Um, I would want you to reflect back on some of the things that you've heard and hopefully um, what I'm going to say will cue some of those reminders for you too. For me, one of the great features of this conference has been the focus on the how. How can we translate the research into practice? A number of speakers, including Karen Knapp, reminded us that we already have the evidence base. There's 40 years of research that tells us then when parents are positively and actively involved in their child's learning, then those children are more likely to do well at school regardless of the family's income or background. That's a very, very powerful motivator. And it seems self-evident that this is something that we should be doing. And in fact, it's almost inexcusable that we're not. So as part of an organisation whose sole focus is on supporting children to grow who are growing up in disadvantaged circumstances to make the most out of their education, I have seen how firsthand how effective this approach can be in the work that we do in partnership with our families, with schools and with other community organisations. The starting premise of our work and one which is at the heart of the approach the Smith family takes and as I alluded to earlier, it's all parents almost without exception, absolutely want the best for their children. They want them to grow up, to be happy, healthy and to have productive, meaningful lives. Our job is to support them in that endeavour. So across the two and a half days of this conference, we've heard from a whole range of practitioners who are seeing a meaningful difference in student outcomes as a result of changing their own mindsets and the way that they work with families. There were some fantastic examples across the back breakout se sessions and an excellent overview was provided by Belinda Wall on how school partnerships can make real and a long-term difference. We've been provided with a whole range of frameworks, tools and resources that will enable parents, schools and the broader community to work as a team to support and encourage children's learning. Practical tools that we can use to inform the way that we work, 
with families or if you're a parent in how you interact with school professionals. On our first afternoon, Bill Lucas talked about allowing yourself to approach a problem in a different way, embracing the notion of adventurous learning. He talked about enabling growth mindsets in the continuum across home and school learning environments. Jill Callister reminded us that children don't distinguish between settings. For them, every setting is a learning setting. And this morning, Heather Weiss spoke powerfully about the notion of any time, anywhere learning in a changing world. I love that cartoon that she showed about the student texting the answer. Um, I think that one will stay with me as well. <laughs> Minister Birmingham talked about the importance, the important role that parents play and their legacy of influence. He reminded us of Professor John Hattie's research that more than 50% of student achievement relates to outside school factors. That while quality teaching is absolutely vital, that teachers can't shoulder the burden alone. That educational outcomes are everybody's business. And this theme of it takes a village to raise a child arose again and again throughout the conference. The minister noted that parents have a big responsibility in this regard, the greatest responsibility, but that we need to support them with research-informed practice and practical measurement around how they're tracking. How we are tracking, rather. Uh, another key theme was around the importance of conversations and building relationships and trust. And weren't there some amazing conversations that we all had over the last three days? There was also this theme of tele telephone terror Steve Monaghetti spoke from his dual role as both a parent and a teacher and talked about parents being afraid of teachers and teachers being afraid of parents and the expectation that sees, um, when either sees the other's number come up, they think, oh, there's a problem. We can overcome these issues through building respectful relationships, through communication, and if we don't have these in place, that's when the cracks begin to appear. Karen Mapp spoke to us about the seven high impact practices, and they were all based around creating a space for open communication and conversation. How can we break down the institutional <coughs> barriers that families find so hard to penetrate? She emphasised that it's not about hard to reach families, it's about hard to penetrate institutions. How can we open up what Karen called regular opportunities for authentic and meaningful engagement of families, students and community members in joint decision making? This morning, I think Tim uh, uh, stunned us all first thing in the morning. I hadn't had enough coffee for the richness of, uh, and deep insights that he provided for us into the, the neurobiological basis for our communication encouraging us to hold up the mirror to our communication. And in essence, as he said, it's of course all about relationships. It's about how services are delivered, just as much about what is delivered. There was also a strong theme around listening with passion, a reminder that this is where the real insights come from and where expertise in, is born that conversations are not one way. They're an opportunity to access the wisdom of parent knowledge as so beautifully and powerfully defined by Debbie Pusher. They are an opportunity for parent knowledge to walk alongside teacher knowledge and enable better outcomes for children. Like many of you, as we heard earlier, that story of the young boy with the eagle feather in his beanie is going to stay with me for a long time as a reminder. But perhaps the most important theme for me is that in the end, it's all about creating better outcomes for children and young people. It's about keeping them at the heart of everything we do. About being intentional and systematic in our practice and then going to the evidence. It's not about being involved in what Jenny Brassington termed random acts of family engagement. We saw a lot of the Broffenbrenner model in various presentations. That model still has relevance. Think, and then think about the links between this model and user-centred design thinking. We also received a reminder to do our work through and with rather than to people. 
So my call to action to all of you is to think about what Jenny termed your path to mastery. What will it be? I urge you to plan your actions. What contract are you going to make with yourself to ensure that you change at least one thing in your practice as a result of what you've heard and experienced here? Who have you met that you can stay in touch with? Where are the local or virtual networks that you can form for support? How can you, as Heather Weiss termed it, create possibilities? I know that the Smith family team working in our school hubs in Tasmania are already planning a follow-up workshop to talk through what they have learned here and, how to, and to plan how it will inform their practice going forward. And I'm looking forward to hearing the results of those conversations. So in final closing, there's some huge thanks that I need to say. And firstly, I want to say a very warm and heartfelt thanks to Erasi for partnering with us in this event. Stephen and the team have been wonderfully collaborative partners and it's been a total pleasure to work with them on this project, although they did most of the hard work really, I suspect. I wanted to call out and pay a particular thanks to Kelly Sidlachuk, the event organiser for the conference, who's been absolutely amazing in her organisation, her responsiveness. <laughs> Stephen, I think she probably deserves at least a couple of days off, maybe. <laughs> I also want to acknowledge Barbara Barker, Aracy's research manager, who has led a very open and consultative process to pull this conference together. And also want to acknowledge Ms. Barbara, <laughs> the rest of the Aracy team, Dale, Jacob, Zoya, Charlie, Rebecca and Viv. Thank you for all of your hard work. Huge thanks also to the members of the Expert Reference Group, the Parent Engagement Champions, the co-conveners of the Parent Engagement Network. All of you have played an enormous role in pulling um, this conference together. And there are others to thank as well. I'll just turn to my slide. We also, of course, want to acknowledge them especially which is right here in front of me. Um, I want to acknowledge the Australian Government Department of Education and Training, um, the Australian Sports Commission, the other sponsors, Starting Blocks, Beyond Blue, Ian Potter Foundation and Good Start Early Learning. Thank you for your generous support. Of course, the amazing conference speakers, weren't they incredible? What diversity, so many of you. Thank you so much. And then, of course, all the people behind the scenes who made it happen, uh, Kim, Danny and the team at Think Business Events, as well as Adam, Renee and the Micro Hire AV team. Thank you very much for making this look good. And finally, to Swinburne University, the students um, from the university are producing a documentary, which is just fantastic. And so, in just the final thing that I want to say is, you know, having set out the challenge. You might need, um, I'll just go to the next slide. So these are a whole lot of resources that you may find useful in reflecting further on what you've seen, heard, learnt, you know, where you can get more information. So I really encourage you um, to use those resources. Yes, everyone's taking photos, I love that. Yes, that's because we only have one tool now, as, as we've just been <laughs> discussing. Um, so look, uh, my final thanks is um, very much to all of you, particularly for staying for the graveyard shift, really appreciated. So thank you for turning up, participating and being such fabulous participants in this first parental engagement conference. Thank you so much. <laughs> Travel safely.